afternoon, everyone, and welcome to Planning Live. My name is Karen Hamilton, and I'm a partner in Brodie's planning team, and I'm delighted to be joined for today's session on judicial review by my teammate and follow, uh, fellow partner, Neil Collar, as well as today's special guest, another Neil, um, Neil McLean, who is a solicitor advocate, partner in the firm and a member of Brodie's advocacy unit. So I feel like I may have to call them Collar and McLean for the rest of the session to avoid confusion. It does sound like a, a bit of a 70s detective show, so maybe that's not the best name tag. Um, but anyway, it's been another busy month in the world of planning, not least, of course, because we've had uh, the latest version of NPF 4 now laid before the Parliament um, earlier in the month. Now, just really to mention that we're not going to be talking about the detail of NPF 4 today, but um, more news just on that front uh, at the end of this session. OK, so if you've tuned in before, you'll be familiar with the format. It's just an informal chat about planning topics. And today's topic is judicial review or planning court challenges generally, really, which can include statutory challenge, challenges where you've had an appeal and um, one of the parties is wanting to appeal against the reporter's decision. I think judicial review is one of these topics that we're constantly asked about, whether it, it may be a developer client who's wanting to know when it's safe, considered safe to implement a permission, or perhaps they're thinking about the prospects for challenging um, a decision that they may be unhappy with, or it may be a planning authority client who's wanting to try to ensure that their decision processes are as robust as possible. And all of that involves thinking about risk and process and also the likely approach of the courts. So Neil number two, Neil McLean, is ideally placed to join us today um, due to his extensive experience in planning litigation in the court of session on all sides of the fence. I think we could say Neil um, representing clients in a number of prominent cases over the last few years. So I'll hand over now to the two Neils to kick off our chat. Um, thanks, Karen. And uh, I'm now feeling old because, of course, the two Neils reminds me of the two Ronnies, and that's definitely old now. Um, <clears throat> i delighted to be chatting to Neil because we work together a lot. So um, that makes today really easy because, unlike um, previous guests, I don't need to worry too much. Um, I know um, Neil will be able to deal with all of these questions. And, and um, in fact, as a solicitor advocate, he's used to difficult questions in, in court, and we'll maybe come on to that in a minute. Maybe, maybe Neil, just starting um, with an explanation of, uh, we refer to you as a solicitor advocate, um, and, and that is um, a particular uh, role quite defined. So maybe just if you could start by explaining what that means and, and what you actually do. Yeah, of course, no problem, Neil. Um, and I'm delighted to be part of, of a double act with you, um, be it as a detective or um, as a, <laughs> a, a, a comedy duo. Um, so being a solicitor advocate it just means that you have rights of audience in the higher courts in the country. So you're, you're still a solicitor, but you also perform this dual function. So the easiest way to think about it for people listening is you'll be used to seeing on television um, barristers, cases, uh, with wigs on delivering the argument in court. And that's really what a solicitor advocate does. And um, they are um, the part of the legal team that um, actually does the speaking um, in court. But of course, all the other parts of, of the legal team are, are, are very important too. Um, and, and as a solicitor advocate, what's interesting is you get sort of both experiences. You get the experience of being a solicitor um, and sometimes you're instructing cases and, and you're not doing the advocacy yourself, but other times you're, you're doing it. And certainly when it comes to, to planning cases, most of not all the time, I'll, I will probably be doing at least some of the advocacy myself. Um, and one of the things that uh, people who've been involved in court actions before will be familiar with um, is the idea of having a senior and a junior, mm -hmm. a, a KC, obviously, as we're now referring to them, and um, a junior, both of them being advocates. Um, and uh, 
I remember when solicitor advocates were introduced, there was the amusing concept of mixed doubles. So have you ever played mixed doubles? And can you actually explain what on earth that is? Yes. So I have played mixed doubles many times. Um, so th that basically means where you have a solicitor advocate and somebody who is at the bar um, in, in Scotland. So um, somebody who is an, um, an advocate um, who sits within a stable of other advocates rather than a solicitor at a law firm. And that just refers to a combination of a solicitor advocate um, and counsel, be it senior or junior. And, and actually what's quite common, it, it, certainly in my practice, um, is to, to act um, alongside um, KCs at the bar. So as junior counsel in, in, in sort of more um, significant planning cases. Um, and indeed, I'm remembering uh, within our advocacy, uh, I'll probably get this wrong, advocacy by Brodies. Indeed. Yeah. That is the title. Mm -hmm. um, we, we have um, several KCs, so yes. there is the opportunity for you to, to sit and, and work with them. <laughs> yeah, that's yeah. right. Um, and um, just thinking about what it's like to appear in court, because this is the interesting thing for me, um, the way me, my traineeship worked, I had very few opportunities to appear in court, mm -hmm. which I was quite delighted about because the few I did were terrifying. Um, I, I, as many people will know, I do a lot of planning inquiry advocacy. Um, uh, because I'm not a solicitor advocate, I can't do your job. Um, ironically, you could do my job, um, but let's not go there. Um, I, Appearing at planning inquiries, my experience is the, the Scottish government reporters um, uh, tend to be in, in listening mode. So although they'll maybe ask questions, um, it, it, it doesn't too often get into much of a discussion. It tends to be a question if there's a legal issue or, or they want an explanation from the lawyer, um, we'll give them one and, and they write it. And, and quite often that's as far as it goes. Uh, I, I, I have the feeling perhaps that judges don't give you as a solicitor advocate just quite such an easy ride? Yeah, so I mean, certainly my experience is, is that the higher you go up in the courts, um, the more challenging it's likely to be in, in terms of, of the questions that you're going to be asking. And that's entirely proper because what once you're into the sort of higher courts then the issues tend to be more serious for for all of the clients involved and it's absolutely proper that the, the judges test and um, the the arguments um one of the things that people will always say about advocacy is that it should feel like a conversation um, admittedly quite a difficult conversation <laughs> at times where you don't often know um, all of um, the answers uh, and, and really when you get asked questions what you should be thinking about is that the, the judge is asking you a question because they want um, you to help them that, that's why they're asking you the question and your answer is probably always going to be yes no or it depends and uh, often your it depends leads to, to other questions so um it, it, like everything, it really just comes down to preparation. I, I often think that there's not really any magic to it. If you're well prepared and you know your case um, and you know what your client's instructions are, that then you should be able to deal deal with the questions that come your way. Hmm. And um, <clears throat> from the discussions we've had, I get the impression that uh, as with uh, planning appeals that go to inquiries, uh, a lot of the work is front loaded, a lot of it is done in writing in advance, so that um, uh, when you actually pitch up on the day, um, there's a really narrow focus. So is that similar in the court scenario? It is, a, and absolutely more so now than it ever has been in the past. I think historically what used to happen, and I've certainly had this experience, is that you would turn up at court, um, the judge probably hadn't read anything before you arrived and you might not even get to start at 10 a.m. Um, so there'll be a lot of hanging around for, for clients um, and for, for the lawyers involved. But now, um, thankfully, uh, the, the judges are really well read into cases. And actually, as you say, Neil, a lot of the work is done before you actually even stand up in court. So preparation of your court pleadings um, and your notes of argument, all of those things that um, you, you get really valuable client input into before you even get into court. So actually, you're coming there uh, with the court well read, ready to ask you questions about your case, ready to test it. And um, so 
I, I always say to clients, that's why we, we get so uptight about the court pleadings and what goes into notes of argument, and because they are really now quite important documents in a way that um, can really can really shift the balance of a case before you've even even got into court. Hmm. Um, and that was very much uh, talking about um, court stuff in general, maybe judicial review in a bit more uh, specific, but moving on to planning in, in particular. Um, uh, and this is something you and I have discussed a bit um, as to what is it about planning that makes it particularly prone to judicial review? Because I think statistically um, it is uh, one of the, the biggest topic areas, as it were, in judicial review. Absolutely. I mean, certainly if you take away immigration and asylum appeals, um, which are which make up the bulk of um, judicial review actions in the court session, I would say that next is definitely planning. Um, and and there's, there are all sorts of reasons for that. I mean, planning is about making stuff happen. And when you make stuff happen, you sometimes upset people or people want to, to challenge the decision mm -hmm. that's taken. So um, you know, it, it has a unique um, place because it affects everybody and because it affects everybody that that leads to to people questioning the decisions that that are taken um there are also um areas in planning which lend itself to challenging so for example environmental impact assessment and um, you know that raises obviously issues that are the forefront of a lot of people's minds um environmental um concerns uh, and people will be poring over over those reports and looking at what the impact of, of a development might be and um, planning is also um not not completely uniquely but but more so than some other areas subject to all these other overarching duties so it, it's not just a, a straightforward decision about necessarily where, whether the planning authority is going to grant the permission they have to think about the equality impact potentially of granting that decision they have to think about the socio-economic impact if it's a listing building they have to think about the tests um, under um, the, the, the listed buildings act so all of those things mean that there are um, a lot of a lot of elements that can sometimes go wrong in, in that decision making exercise and i think that that lends itself to, to scrutiny by judicial review yeah, and um, Karen mentioned at the beginning about MPF4 and said we weren't going to talk about it, and we're not, but I'm just going to mention it in passing. Um, inevitably, uh, some of the early days discussions that we are having within our planning team about MPF4 and implications um, revolve around, well, what will the new legal situation be? Um, it's part of the development plan. What does that mean? Um, and uh, inevitably, as that beds in a uh, period of uncertainty um, and uh, almost certainly will be the subject of some form of legal challenge in its application rather than, I doubt it will probably be challenged in the courts. The approval of it will be more uh, how it's applied in, in planning applications and appeals. Um, one of the things uh, that we see a lot in planning judicial review is this idea of planning judgment. And uh, I'm slightly surprised it's taken us this long to mention it <clears throat> um, because it is a, a, a key issue. And it, it goes back in a way to one of the reasons why planning is quite prone to judicial review, that we've got this concept of planning judgment. It's a very discretionary system. If we think about uh, the classic formula, uh, you decide in accordance with the provision of the development plan unless material considerations indicate otherwise. Well, explaining to somebody who doesn't know about planning what that actually means in practice is quite hard. But what it does is it gives the decision maker quite a degree of flexibility. It means potentially there's quite a lot of uncertainty about actual outcome. But um, with, within that, um, how does this concept of planning judgment play out when you're arguing cases in, in the court? So, so most of the time, if you're holding the decision or acting for the decision maker, you're of course going to say it's all a matter um, of planning judgment. And that sometimes can be one of the key battlegrounds in the cases. Um, you'll have those acting for, for 
for the people holding the decision or defending the decision, trying to force things into, well, this is just all about judgment. Um, and on the other side, you'll have the person bringing the challenge saying, well, this isn't about judgment at all. This is just a straightforward question um, of uh, interpretation. And it, and it can actually be sometimes be quite, um, quite hard to, to define exactly what, what is purely a matter of interpretation or, and what's a matter of um, applying a policy in a particular way where you're exercising um, your judgment. So um, to give you an example, I was involved in a case um, for the, the Scottish ministers, which was all about um, the use of a house as a dwelling house by not more than four looked after children. And, and the case was all about whether it fell within use class nine um, of the, the use classes order. And, and really yeah, what I was arguing for the ministers is that the assessment of what constitutes a household for the purposes um, of the use classes order was a question of fact and degree in every case. So therefore a, a classic case of, of planning um, judgment um, but at the hearing I, I remember being pushed pretty hard on that as to whether that was actually um, a, a matter of planning judgment at all um, and what the court ultimately said is that they didn't um, they didn't think it was an exercise involving planning judgment they just looked at the construction of class nine of the use classes order um, and said that you know, just looking at, at the plain words in the use class that it didn't fall within that. So there, you didn't actually even have to exercise any judgment. They were just saying as a straightforward matter of interpretation, um, ministers were correct. So getting to the, the same answer, but in a slightly different way. But I suppose I, I mentioned it because it demonstrates that, um, well, demonstrates two things. One, that that's always going to be an argument in planning cases. And two, you can't predict necessarily what the court is going to make of it because neither neither me who was defending the decision or our counsel for the appellant were arguing that point at all. I, and I, I suppose, again, that goes back a little bit to my compare and contrast with reporters on, on planning appeals that um, uh, judges uh, feel more able to throw in their own arguments and their own opinions in a way that um, reporters uh, feel um, uh, they are more uh, boxed in by the case that's been presented to them. And, and I think actually um, you were involved uh, in a court of session case. It was the one about the permitted development rights where that came up as that issue of if the issue hasn't been argued by the parties, there's not really uh, an onus on the reporter to say, actually, maybe that should have been argued. Tell me about it. That's right. And so th th that's the case of Taylor against the Scottish ministers. And, and there's a good phrase in that case in which the so Lord President, who wrote the, the main judgment, talks about the, the really the <laughs> obligation is to give parties a fair crack of the whip when it comes to um, appeals before reporters. So um, really, the emphasis is on the people in that appeal to put the arguments before the reporter that they want the reporter um, to consider. Um, the only sort of caveat to that is if there is something glaringly obvious you know, that from the, the papers that the reporter ought to consider, then um, you know, they may be criticised further down the line for, for, for failing to do that. But generally, absolutely, it's based on what, what is put before the reporter by both parties. Um, and that can, and if, you, if there's something you don't put before the reporter and then try and introduce it um, at, at an appeal before the court of session and they're, they're likely to, to say that they're, they're not going to consider that, that point. Just casting my mind back to when we had Scott Ferry on the uh, the session last time round and Elaine was asking him about the number of procedure notices that uh, might tend to be um, issued by reporters and that, you know, parties could just be chomping at the bit to to get on to, to reach a decision. So I guess from that perspective, reporters, uh, you know, have a have a tough time because if they're asking too many questions and trying to tease the information out of the parties and um, people aren't happy about that. But yet if they're going to bash on and um, not elicit information, uh, parties can be left unhappy about that as well. But but of course, you're quite right that, they, that there's no duty there for, for them to be um, investigating the parties' cases for them. Um, if I can just uh, throw in a question that's come up, um, and Rob McIntosh from uh, Aberdeenshire Council has asked, it's maybe something that you, you were going to come on to, but um, 
do we have, is there information available about the rates of success in, in planning GRs? Rob makes the point that, um, of course, we see these that information published um, when the DPA stats come out on, on planning appeals at first instance. So is there is there an equivalent um, that we can that we can see from litigation or uh, or are we left just to have a look at the cases that are published to try and work it out for ourselves? So Neil, Collar, I don't know if you want to, to start because I'm conscious that you do prepare a very helpful um, report and then I'll maybe talk about the cases that, that aren't reported. Yeah, um, I, when I have a chance, I do quite often do a blog. So it maybe just isn't quite regularly every year, but um, <clears throat> I, but it's something you can only do by analysing it that way. There isn't a central information resource as such. Um, <clears throat> the success rate from memory is something like three out of seven. Um, uh, and uh, Neil will explain in a minute um, because we, we did actually discuss this in, in sort of preparing. Um, my blog is based on decisions that are issued um, and Neil will explain uh, well, in fact, actually, I'll just pass over to Neil to explain what what does that not include. So, so the one that doesn't include, of course, is challenges that have been brought and and have been conceded. Um, so, the, I mean, you get some visibility of that, obviously, from acting from the parties that are involved in in those challenges. But actually, um, there are there are quite a number of judicial reviews that are that are brought and, and never get to a hearing, and um, for pragmatic reasons, either because um, the uh, petitioner withdraws because they, they they've basically brought a tactical challenge which they no longer want to proceed with because they've they've sought an alternative route, for example, putting in a, a fresh planning application, um, or the planning authority decides that they want to concede um, because having looked at the prospects that the, the prospects of success um, are poor. So it's, it's actually very difficult to give a definitive uh, number on the prospects of success because you will only see the cases that, that come across your desk apart from the reported ones. Um, so that that kind of gives you a feel. I mean, sort of my, my overall take on it is that the, the numbers in the reported cases are probably not a million miles off what the actual number would be if you were if you were able to include all of those um, cases that are brought that, that that don't make it to a full hearing, but of course possible possible to say for sure. And we've even had some cases where there's been a discussion with the planning authority in advance of raising an action. It's actually been agreed um, between the parties that to resolve a particular problem where there's an acknowledged um, sort of defect in a decision that a GR will be raised, the authority will um, agree to or agree not to defend, agree indeed to meet the expenses of, of the action being raised um, and, and, to, and to let judgment um, be issued. And that's been, that's been a useful way of dealing with a couple of unusual cases where there's been that sort of acknowledgement up front by the authority. Yeah, absolutely, and including a, an unusual situation where elected members um, brought to judicial review against their own authority in circumstances where you know it was agreed that that was really the only remedy that that would fix the the particular problem. So, um, because it, it was a scenario in which revocation um, wouldn't work, um, so what, what what parties needed was a court order, and it was all done done by way of consent. And uh, that's reminding me again, just in that sense of unreported cases of, of one that um, uh, Neil um, uh, did for me uh, with uh, a developer who had got planning permission and it was challenged by a third party. And um, the planning authority on advice of council decided not to defend that judicial review. Um, uh, Neil and myself had looked at it and um, we felt uh, there was still merit in continuing to oppose the judicial review. Um, and uh, the third party, uh, because their client decided to keep going, the third party actually withdrew their case. Um, so that was one where uh, we assisted our client to, to keep their permission as it were, because if, uh, our client is equally thrown in the towel, um, the likelihood is the court would have quashed the permission and it would have gone back for a redetermination and 
Um, in that particular case, there was a possibility it might have got refused second time round. Um, may, maybe actually just uh, having mentioned that, there's a couple of points to, to ask Neil in the sense of um, occasionally uh, we hear discussions about um, even if a decision has been made uh, in an Ill illegal way, it's an invalid decision, um, the judge is having discretion to say, but I'm not going to quash it. Um, so in that particular instance of the parties agreeing there is a defect and whether the judge is actually obliged to 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 quash it. Um, and um, what what's the reality about that sort of situation, Neil? So so the reality is is that it's quite rare in Scotland for to, for you to get to the end of a hearing. Um, for the petitioner or appellant to have succeeded on the grounds and for a Scottish court to decide not to quash the decision. Um, that contrasts with the position in England. In England, there is um, an Act of Parliament, the Senior Courts Act 1981, which in contains a, a test um, which basically says that it, if it appears to be highly likely um, that the outcome for the applicant would not have been substantially different, um, then the court can exercise discretion not to quash um, the decision. So, so if the outcome was would not have been substantially different, that's the test. Uh, and similar to the test applies at common law um, in Scotland, but I can't think of any any example of a case that I've been involved in, or, or and actually you, you do struggle to find any reported cases in Scotland where that has actually um, happened. And I've sort of been thinking about the, the sort of situation in which it might happen. And I suppose it might happen in a case where, um, for example, somebody says that there's been a failure to comply with the public sector equality duty. So but that just means you need to take into account certain equality um, objectives from the from the Equality Act. But that there had been no mention, for example, of equalities issues in any of the objections. Um, so it wasn't really a live issue in the permission. And it's pretty clear that the permission um, was granted on pure planning grounds, if I can put it that way. You know, if the court was dealing with a challenge at, at that point, and it was clear that the authority hadn't thought about the public sector quality duty at all, you might see a court saying, well, it wouldn't have made any difference here because there weren't really any live equalities issues in this case. And it's pretty clear reading the decision as a whole why it was granted. That's the sort of thing that, that might might lead but it's it's generally not a good place to be though if you're you're in a in territory where you're saying i think we, i think we've got a problem here but please don't quash please don't quash uh, <laughs> the decision i think though neil what it does do is just sort of demonstrate quite well what what we often talk about in the team if somebody's raising a, a point about judicial review that often even if they're um uh, you know if there's a point that may be likely to, to lead to the quashing of a planning permission it may be a pinnick victory for the challenger at the end of the day if of course it goes back to be to to be reconsidered and the same decision is is taken again um second time round but without that defect sometimes of course parties are a, a challenger may, may simply be interested in delay and um, which which may give them an advantage and, and and sometimes that could even have the result of development ultimately not happening because of changed circumstances but uh, you know it's, it's one of the first things that we'll say to if we get that random phone call from um, perhaps from a member of the public who's interested in in trying to challenge a permission that they're not happy about nine cases out of ten it's not really going to get them anywhere in terms of you know the merits at the end of the day absolutely so, um, and uh, going back to uh, the likelihood of judicial review uh, and and one thing we're always conscious of again <clears throat> as Karen's saying when we get the phone call um, one of the first things we're always explaining to people is uh, judicial review is not cheap. Um, uh, legal aid has not been available for it for ages. Um, uh, so that is a big um, potential issue. Um, but I know, Neil, you've been involved in some situations where crowdfunding has become uh, a, a possibility. Um, and uh, we also have the concept of PEOs, 
and like all acronyms, you're thinking, hang on a minute, what does that stand for again? Protective expenses orders. That's right. Um, well so m m maybe chat us through um, this um, emerging concept of, of crowdfunding and litigation and also um, <clears throat> how in, in planning GRs, other GRs, PEOs have uh, a, a, an implication and some uh, value perhaps to certain um, classes of of litigants. Sure. Yep. So the, the two have actually um, started to become become linked. Um, it was quite interesting to see the the emergence of crowdfunding and it and it initially initially started to be used for um, sort of public interest challenges um, brought you know, in relation to holding the, the government to account, in relation to procurement of contracts, that sort of thing, or or decisions in relation to um, junior doctors' pay, that, that those were the first kind of big crowd um, funding cases. And there's now a whole industry um, around around crowdfunding for, for litigation. So it's well understood that it can be used as a tool to get resources to bring um, a legal challenge there. There are two types of protective expenses order. I won't get into the technical detail. There's there's ones that can be granted in relation to environmental cases, um, and there are ones that can just be granted at, at common law. So for, for any other um, type of judicial review, and and there are various steps you need you need to go through. Um, but the one I, I suppose I'd, I'd like to focus on and and mention in, in in this scenario is one of the things the court has to look at as to whether it's going to grant um, a, a protective expenses order is the financial resources of the the applicant um, and the amount of costs that are likely to be um, involved in environmental cases. That's all about litigation being prohibitively expensive. And what happens is if a PEO is granted, it insulates um, a party from having to meet the legal expenses or legal costs of the other side and caps them at a level, usually um, for, a, for an applicant at about £5,000. So that would be their, their ultimate exposure if, if they lost the case. And there's been lots of interest and discussion about what you actually need to bring to court in terms of the to show your financial resources. And um, we certainly have cases where we've been instructed to initially oppose the grant of a, a protective expenses order until the applicant produces evidence which basically shows their individual exposure. Um, it becomes quite complicated in crowdfunding cases though because there is a decision of the court in, in a case Keatings um, which is all to do about um, with um, Scottish independence referendum but the um, in that and um, what the court said is that the petitioner in that case had had raised something like £43,000 from crowd, crowdfunding in a period of less than a month. Um, and what the court said is that the practical reality there appeared to be that they had significant funding to support the action and there was nothing to suggest that they couldn't just go out and get more money through crowdfunding. Um, so in that case, um, the protective expenses order um, wasn't um, wasn't granted partly because of the ability to get um, money from, from other um, sources. Um, what I would say is that there was initially quite a lot of excitement about PEOs, uh, and then some PEOs were, were turned down in some fairly high high profile cases, including in the, the Newton Merrins Flood Prevention Group um, case. Um, and we didn't really see PEOs for a while. Um, but what I would say is that they seem to be back and there also seems to be more of an approach, certainly, on the, the respondent planning authority side of not not opposing them, or or at least not opposing them fully. So asking a question about resources, but then ultimately um, just accepting that, that the applicant has done enough um, and, and allowing the case to go ahead with a PEO in place. Um, so that you know it may may lead to to more challenges, but we'll just have to wait and see. And. Um... Going back to talking about the court and the judges and <clears throat> that side of it, uh, what would you say is the, the current mood of the court towards planning cases? Because uh, I've, I've certainly had the feeling from various conversations we've had that although we don't have a specialist planning court, um, <clears throat> just because there's not enough volume to justify it, um, a, the, the court has maybe taken a bit more of a specialist approach in some ways. Yeah, so I, I think if you were to read the recent decisions of the court, 
you would notice a theme that the, the bench is, is reasonably settled. So um, at the moment, and I don't think this is a secret, um, generally the Lord President, so the highest judge um, in the country, will hear planning appeals in the Court of Session. So he will sit with what's called the First Division um, of the Court of Session, so the most senior judges. And that's really bringing, I think, some cons consistency to the decision making there, because what you have is not only um, judges who are read into the case, in a lot of detail, but who understand planning and planning concepts, um, which I think is helpful. Um, that's not to say you're always going to win in, in, in that case, particularly um, if you're, you're acting for the government, because we certainly see um, in, in relation to the cases on housing land supply that the court has quashed decisions of, of ministers. Um, but I think it is generally helpful um, to have a set of judges who really know what they're doing um, in, in relation to these cases, because um, it means that, that actually for those presenting them, you get right to the heart of the case quite quickly. Um, and it becomes that, that difficult conversation that, that I talked about, um, which you know, really helps focus the issues um, early on. And, and I think is, it, it is leading to, to decisions that, that make sense and are coherent and um, are, are easy to follow. Um, so, so the mood of the court at the moment is that they're taking planning very seriously and, it, and it's being dealt with by, by the most um, senior judges. Now, the only exception to that, of course, is I'm talking here about appeals against for example, decisions of reporters. Um, of course, judicial reviews uh, don't go into that court immediately. Um, and there, yeah. um, what happens is you're just allocated um, a judge that's available um, to hear the case. Um, so there, you might have somebody who's less experienced in planning um, law. And that's why it's important to understand who your judge is going to be um, at the start of any case and, and what their experience is likely to be and whether there's um, anything that you can do to be particularly um, helpful um, to that to that judge. Yeah, and, and maybe just to uh, I I explain a bit about that, because um, <clears throat> to the non-lawyers, it might seem strange. To the lawyers, it probably seems strange. <laughs> and it's probably just a historic work but um, <clears throat> the planning act gives what technically speaking is a statutory appeal but it's judicial review ground so in shorthand we refer to it as uh, judicial review um, that statutory appeal uh, as, as Neil was saying goes to the inner house of the court of session <clears throat> which is three or more judges it's typically three though isn't it so that's where it's the scenario of the Lord President um, uh, um, he he heading that up. Um, the, the other situation, common law judicial review, um, that's where, for instance, um, the planning authority's decision uh, on a planning application is being challenged by um, a third party objector. Um, that is not a, a statutory challenge. Um, so uh, that follows the usual judicial review procedure, as it were, and that goes to the outer house, which is a single judge. And that's where, as Neil said, it's a little bit more of a lottery about whether that judge has experience of, of planning or not. Um, and to complete the picture, I think I'm right in saying the decision or, or the, the case can get transferred from the outer house to the inner house. Yes. We won't go into that. It's just it's a possibility. Um, a, um, so all a bit complicated, but um, I, I hear what you say. The main thing is um, knowing which court it's going to, because the, you then know what degree of specialism uh, the judge or judges are going to have and that possibly having a bearing in the outcome of the case. Um, and, and maybe just picking up on a, a particular issue before we finish up, um, quite a lot of uh, decisions in the last few years looking, scrutinising um, reports of handling reports to committee um, and that being a, a favourite line of attack um, from whoever's attacking that um, the feeling in some way that the, the report misrepresents um, the case, the situation doesn't tell the full story um, and the implications for the decision that's then made on the back of that report. So um, what's your take, Neil, on uh, the approach the court 
takes to that sort of challenge. So, so generally, the, the court is not going to quash a, a decision based on what is in the, the report of handling or or the um, a report prepared by a reporter for, for ministers. Um, fairly consistent line of cases that talk about the need to, to read that report as a whole, as an informed reader, um, and that it doesn't need to contain you know, every single thing that was put in front of the, the officer or reporter. And that said, you do see some challenges started to come through about sort of what, what we would call a, a material error of fact challenge. So that there is something in the report that is just incorrect and is it, or is misleading in some way. And those um, grounds of challenge are, are, are difficult to succeed with, but not impossible. So if you can point to something that is just clearly wrong, um, you know, for example, that um, I'm trying to think of an issue that, you know, there was a, a flood risk report that had it, the report says that it was before the, the committee or that they had regard to it and that just didn't exist, that flood risk report just didn't exist at all or didn't exist at that point in time, then that's the sort of material um, sort of error or material um, error of fact that's, that's missing that might lead to a successful challenge. But overall, when you're into criticising things in the report or what the report says, you're firmly in that territory of planning judgment, which the court is just not going to interfere with un un unless um, something um, has gone plainly wrong, or or the legal test is you know irrational. So, you know, it just there's just something terribly bad about, about what what is in the report. But still, you still see a lot of challenges in that basis. And that's I'm sure very comforting to uh, to planning authorities, whether it's for officers preparing those reports, or when we think about cases that may be um, in front of LRBs and and how those get get reported, which um, they've you know had a, had a steep learning curve, albeit the bit that pro that system has been in for a number of years now. But um, so I suppose just to finish off, then Neil, you know, based on on your experience of, of planning challenges and advising as you do from time to time. Um, authorities and decision makers, as well as perhaps people who may be um, mounting the challenge. What, what would be your what would be your top tip to decision makers to try to avoid getting into that situation in the first place? What is it so, that makes good decision making? So first, I'm going to plug the Scottish government's guidance, getting it right first time, which is actually really good. And um, there's a UK government equivalent, which is slightly more dramatically called the judge over your shoulder. So, um, which is also good, um, but, but has um, perhaps a, a more OTT title. But there's lots of helpful stuff in that about decision making and how to protect decisions from challenge. All I would say is if you're an officer sitting down to write a report and it's obvious that there are qualities issues in it in the case, mention the public sector equality duty and the social economic duty. Say you've had regard to them because it just makes somebody trying to defend that decision from challenge jobs so much easier. Similarly, if you're dealing with a listed building, again, mention that act. I know that it's really annoying to have to mention loads of bits of legislation, but it just, again, makes it so much easier if you're trying to defend that decision from challenge. If it says somewhere in that decision that you looked at that, that legislation, it's not to say that you won't always be able to defend the decision. It just makes my job in particular, if I'm defending it in court, that, that bit easier. So we hear we hear that plea in that, uh, ladies and gentlemen, is why you have such long uh, planning planning reports going off to committee. Um, okay, well, I'm just conscious of the time, so um, I think we'll probably look to just uh, gather things to um, a close at this point. So. Really interesting stuff. Um, it's fascinating to think that for every planning judgment that uh, uh, that we we read coming out of the court of session, there may be another five or ten uh, that that we never get to to hear about every time because they've been been settled behind the scenes and and what actually has been going on in some of those cases. Um, but I, th I think, well, we'd all want to avoid being in the position of uh, finding ourselves in, in court with a planning challenge. It's, it's really helpful to get an, a better understanding of the court's approach and what, what the judges can and can't do to, to try and avoid getting caught up in that situation in the first place. So. So thanks everyone for listening in to today's session and thank you especially to, to Neil McLean for giving up his time to join us um, on, on Planning Live.
Uh, I said at the beginning of the session that I would have some something more to say about NPF4 at the end. I'm sure you've you've not been waiting with bated breath. But our next planning live session is going to be in the new year when we'll be joined by Minister Tom Arthur for a discussion on the national planning framework. And that will be followed by another session uh, with Neil, Elaine and myself uh, talking about NPF4 if you haven't had enough by then. So invites to those two sessions will be coming out in the next couple of weeks. So do, do sign up to those um, if you can. And we'd love to, uh, to have you join us for those sessions in the new year. It feels funny to be talking about the new year already. It's not even quite the end of November. But if we don't happen to be speaking to you or seeing you again before Christmas, have a great time when it comes, have a great break, and we will hopefully see you all again in the new year. So goodbye for this afternoon. <laughs>